So thank you for the wonderful introduction. So um, what I want to talk about today is really the early days of the development of quantum computing and tell you some anecdotes about them and give you some vague idea about how quantum computing works and you know, some ideas about you know, what the problems are in you know, scaling it up for um, reasonable computations. So let's go back. Um, let's go back to the 1930s. So from its conception, quantum mechanics has been recognized as a strange theory. And there are many, many quotes on the internet from the early you know, developers of quantum mechanics saying how strange a theory it is. Unfortunately, they're all apocryphal. <laughs> <laughs> so here is one, not from the early days, 1964, which is you know, 30 years into real quantum mechanics from Feynman. And this really does, you know, he says, if you simply admit that nature, maybe nature does behave like this, you will find her a delightful, entrancing thing. But do not keep saying to yourself, if you can possibly avoid it, how can it be like that? Because you will get down the drain into a blind alley from which nobody has escaped. And let me point out that Feynman did not actually follow his advice. <laughs> when I was at Caltech, he gave a lecture on um, negative probability, which was one way of trying to, you know, figure out how, may, how maybe nature did behave like that. But it turns out that he um, did not succeed in explaining it with negative probability. So when he published his paper on negative probability, he came up with a completely dis different motivation from the one that he had started the research with. So how is quantum mechanics strange? Well, I mean, the double slit experiment is the canonical experiment to say this. If you send a particle through a screen with two slits in it, you will observe an interference pattern. And this doesn't matter if the particle is a photon, so that's light or electron. Um, it, you know, you have interference, which can naturally be explained in terms of waves. But what you can do is you can dilute the, um, or attenuate the electron beam until only one electron goes through the apparatus at a time, and you still see the interference pattern. And what does this mean? Well, the obvious conclusion to draw is that a single electron goes through both slits at once and forms the interference pattern. So this is, this is strange, but if you do experiments and think about this, the early um, founders of quantum mechanics um, put forth the superposition principle, which says if a quantum system can be in one of two mutually distinguished states, that's A and B, then it can be in both these states at once. Namely, it can be superposition of these states, alpha A plus beta B. So this funny notation is the physics way of symbolizing a quantum state. And if you try to distinguish these states, so I said this was mutually distinguishable, distinguishable states, so there's some experiment you can do which tells you whether it's an A or B, and you put this superposition in, it comes out A with probability alpha squared and B with probability beta squared. So to illustrate the absurdity of this superposition principle when it's applied to large objects, Schrodinger asked the equation, well, what about alpha A plus beta B, where A is a live cat and B is a dead cat? Does this superposition make any sense? And you know, he asked this as a reductio ad absurdum to show that this really did, could not possibly apply to macroscopic objects. But over the years, we have done experiments on larger and larger objects, although they're still much, much smaller than cats. And the superposition of principle applies to all of them. So, um, so let's go to qubits. A qubit is a quantum system with two distinguishable states, like the polarization of a photon. So a state of a qubit is represented as a ket. That's that funny notation. And all other states 
can be represented as linear combinations of these basis vectors. So for example, one of the canonical examples of a qubit is a photon, and a photon has a polarization, and a polarization is either vertical or horizontal. And if you've played around with polarizing filters or Polaroid glasses, you'll know that they let through, say, vertical um, polarized photons and um, do not let through horizontally polarized photons. Um, and then if you turn them 45 degrees, they let through 45 degrees photons and do not let through the other diagonal photon. <coughs> so um, what quantum mechanics says is that all states can be represented as combinations of the two basis vectors, vertical po polarization and horizontal polarization. So right diagonal polarization is 1 over root 2 horizontal plus vertical. Left diagonal is 1 over root 2 horizontal minus vertical. And because quantum mechanics uses complex numbers, you can also ask what happens if you say horizontal minus i vertical. And that turns out to be clockwise polarization. OK. And then you continue this. The state space of n qubits is a vector in a true to the n-dimensional vector space. And that means well, that is one of the places that quantum mechanics or quantum computation um, gets all its computational power. And another thing about quantum mechanics, since quantum mechanics, you can have two systems that are correlated more strongly than the classical laws of probability permit. And such systems are called entangled. And this is what Einstein called spooky action at a distance. If you manipulate, oops, if you manipulate one of these two systems and you believe in the classical laws of probability, then you can deduce that you must have made a change in the other system. However, it turns out you can't transmit information faster than the speed of light. So using this method, so you can ask, is this really spooky action or at a distance, or is it just that the laws of probability behave differently in quantum mechanics? And um, I don't think anybody has resolved this question satisfactorily today. So for the first 30 years of the theory of quantum mechanics, nobody really considered using this strangeness. This was um, a weird thing about how nature behaved, but it didn't have any applications as far as anybody was concerned. I mean, they used quantum mechanics to develop lasers and many other things, but they didn't really use the strangeness. So that changed in 1968 when Stephen Wiesner wrote a paper proposing a use for quantum strangeness. And it was called conjugate coding, and it had some very clever ideas. So two concrete examples and some general results are given. And so he sent it to a journal, and it was rejected. <laughs> what happened next was he stuck it in the drawer for a decade and didn't do anything with it. So his friend, Charlie Bennett, pulled it out of the drawer and got it published in 1983. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah, so Wiesner considered two problems in the, this paper. One of the applications he um, described doesn't actually work because of more strangeness of quantum mechanics. <laughs> but the other problem he considered was quantum money. So what's the big problem with money? You can make copies of it. So quantum states satisfy the no cloning theorem, which says you cannot make a copy of an unknown quantum state. So you might think, you know, given the no cloning theorem, that this is perfect for making money out of. Well, this was Wiesner's idea, and I'll try to explain it. So Wiesner's quantum money scheme, um, you have these four polarization states, although um, <coughs> um, this beautiful picture comes from Charlie Bennett. And in each field, there's a sequence of states in one of two complementary bases. So vertical and diagonal are complementary. Vertical and horizontal are complementary, and right diagonal and left diagonal are complementary. 
and you stick the polar photons in a bill, which of course is completely impractical because photons travel at the speed of light, but you could also use other quantum states. Um, and by the laws of quantum mechanics, an aspiring counterfeiter cannot tell which spaces the states are pre prepared in because uh, you know, combination of up or vertical and horizontal looks exactly the same as a combination of right diagonal and left diagonal. This is one of the rules of quantum mechanics. And by the quantum no cloning theorem, anybody who does not know the polarizations of these states cannot copy them. So an aspiring counterfeiter will come along and they will look at the first qubit and they say, well, if it's polarized in the right di diagonal, left diagonal basis, we can copy it. If it's polarized in the up vertical horizontal basis, then if you try to copy it with the procedure for copying it in this basis, you will get random results. So, the pr so the, pr okay, wait. And if you get random results, then Alice and Bob can tell, or rather the, the merchant can t tell that someone has messed with the bill because the, um, the polarizations are not the same as they should be if someone's tried to copy it. So the problem with Wiesner's money is how do you check it? Well, if you don't tell the merchant what the polarization should be, you have to send the bill back to the bank to check whether it's valid. And if you do tell the merchant what the polarizations should be, you really have to trust the merchant because if you tell them, they could copy it. And if you give the merchant a little bit of information about the polarizations, then a coalition of merchants can get together and each of them has a little bit of information, so together they have all the information about polarizations and they can count, create counterfeit bills. So this is impractical. But it was still a very, I want to say it was still a brilliant idea. And it actually led Charlie Bennett and Gilles Broussard to come up with a practical um, cryptographic algorithm using quantum strangeness. So what is key distribution? Key distribution is a cryptographic protocol where two people communicating over a non-secure channel where someone is eavesdropping can agree on a secret key. So this is possible classically if you assume that there's some computational problem like factoring, which is difficult. And then you use the fact that the eavesdropper cannot factor a number to keep your information secure. And you can show that with classical computers, it's impossible unconditionally. But by thinking about Wiesner's quantum money, um, Bennett and Brassard came up with a quantum key distribution protocol that is unconditionally secure and depends only for its security on the laws of physics. And that was, you know, revolutionary. It's the first really practical um, use for quantum um, strangeness. And in fact, if you have enough money, you can buy a quantum key distribution protocol, which is unconditionally secure from a number of companies that are selling them today. Of course, to actually want to buy this, such a system, you, act, you have to be really, truly paranoid. And there are some government agencies in various countries that are really, truly paranoid. And a few of these systems have been sold, but I don't know. I mean, I don't, you're not going to make a ton of money by selling these systems. So what is the BB84 key distribution? So BB from the two authors' names and 84 because it was published in 1984. So Alice sends Bob qubits in one of four states, and these probably are photons, and these are the four same, same four states that, um, you know, Wiesner used for the... Um, quantum money. And here Alice sends these photons to Bob. And Bob measures them in a random basis, either plus, either you know, vertical horizontal or right diagonal, left diagonal. And if he measures them in right diagonal, left diagonal, and his measurement apparatus is perfect, then he gets exactly the same bit that Alice sent. And if he measures them 
in the bases that Alice, if he measures them in the other bases that Alice did not prepare them in, he gets random results. So how do they get a key out? Well, let's assume that all, the, all their apparatus is perfect. They tell each other their basis, and now they know which photons the, were measured in the same basis that they were prepared in, and they keep the bits where their bases agree. And now, because an eavesdropper has to decide which bases to measure the qubits in before Alice and Bob announce their bases, any eavesdropper who's measuring these photons will inevitably make a wrong decision somewhere. And now Alice and Bob take a small fraction of the ones that they agree on, and they tell each other what they should be. And they can detect an eavesdropper because eavesdropper is making their photons disagree. So if their, if their apparatus is imperfect, <coughs> this doesn't quite work as stated because um, some of them are going to disagree anyway. So what they have to do is they have to check that sufficiently many of their qubits agree and then do extra work to reconcile their qubits. And they do this by using an error correcting code and using the error correcting code, they can actually make this protocol secure. So in the 1980s, Charlie Bennett came to Bell Labs to give a talk on his <coughs> key distribution system, which I attended. And he closed his talk with a question, how can you prove that this protocol works? So I thought about this question for a while. But I really couldn't formulate the problem in mathematical terms that were definite enough for me to attack. So I gave up. OK, now I want to go back a little ways in time from the mid-1980s to 1981. 1981, MIT and IBM sponsored a conference on physics and computation. And Richard Feynman gave a keynote address. And if you have keen eyes, you should see him somewhere over in this right-hand right side. And his keynote address was titled Simulating Physics with Computers. And Charlie Bennett also attended this conference, but you can't see him in the photo. And the reason is that he was behind the camera. He was took the photo. So <laughs> he, did not, um, <clears throat> he did not appear in it. So in Feynman's talk, he made the following points. First, it seems exponentially hard to simulate quantum physics with classical computers. And two, maybe we need to build quantum computers to solve this problem. So Yurimanin had made the same observation a couple of years earlier in the Soviet Union. <coughs> and um, I want to say Feynman gets a lot of the credit. And part of the reason is that Yurimanin made the observation and the introduction to a book on complexity theory. And Feynman actually wrote two journal papers about this question. So there were a number of papers that followed Feynman. First was by David Deutsch, and then Deutsch and Josa, Bernstein and Vazrani, and Daniel Simon. And these papers gave, you know, quantum algorithms for various problems, which were more and more convincing that quantum computing was powerful. And Daniel Simon's paper is the one that I used to find the factoring algorithm. So before I figured out the factoring algorithm, I figured out the quantum discrete log algorithm. What is the discrete log problem? Well, given a prime p and residues g and r, find an x such that g to the x is congruent to r mod p. So this is exactly the same as the logarithm, except now you're doing it mod p instead of over the real numbers. And this makes a huge difference in the complexity of this problem. Nobody knows how to solve this quickly on a digital computer. And the fact that it's solved quickly on a, on a quantum computer you know, was really surprising. So both factoring and discrete log are hard problems that can be used as a basis for public key crypto systems, such as one for key distribution. And there's a strange relationship between these problems. There's not an actual reduction from one of these to the other. But any time someone has found an algorithm for one, 
Not too long afterwards, people find a similar algorithm for the other using the same techniques. So they're related problems, but there's no um, actual rigorous mathematical connection between them. So it's looking at Simon's algorithm that I figured out the discrete algorithm, discrete log problem. <clears throat> so Simon's problem was to find the period of a function on the hypercube z mod 2 to the n. So that's just a hypercube here. And you color the points so that if you start here and you move one period, you will get to another point of the same color. So you start here and you move one step in the horizontal direction, one step in the vertical direction, you find another point of the same color. And so that's find the period of the vertices of a high dimensional cube where the vertices are colored two colors is the problem. Now, the discrete log problem can be solved if you can find the period on a long, large torus. For example, here, you can find, you know, start with a green um, point, move two to the right and one up, you will always get to another green point. So, okay, I'm sorry, that's blue. Two to the right and one up, you get to a blue point. And two to the right and one up, you get to another blue point. So the period here is two, one. <clears throat> so the, um, these problems are easy in low dimensions. I mean, you could solve this one just by looking at it. But if you had a two to the n dimensional torus for cube, our uh, torus, which had two to the n points on each side, they become really hard problems. So I first figured out the discrete log for the case for the for the case where p minus one is a smooth number. So a smooth number is a number with only small factors. <clears throat> and this turns out to be the case that was already solvable classically. But the quantum algorithm was so different from the classical algorithm that it encouraged me to keep on trying. And not too long after that, I found the algorithm for discrete log on a torus where p minus one is an arbitrary num number. And the basic idea is to use the Fourier transform. So Fourier transforms are very good at finding periods. And um, Simon's algorithm is solved by using the Fourier transform on the hypercube. And the discrete log is solved by using the Fourier transform over the integers mod m. <clears throat> and, you know, I guess one of the things I had to do was recognize that Simon's algorithm was actually solved using the Fourier transform because, you know, he doesn't mention the Fourier transform in this paper, and you have to recognize that what he's doing is the Fourier transform, and then you have to find the quantum Fourier transform, or Z mod M, and then you have to um, use that to solve the problem. So you know, one of the hard parts was implementing the Fourier transform over Z mod M on a quantum computer. Okay, so news of the factoring algorithm spread faster than you can possibly imagine. So I explained it in an internal seminar at Bell Labs, April 1994, um, only a week or two after I discovered it. And it was on a Tuesday because, you know, it was Henry Landau's seminar, which was held every Tuesday. I don't know which week of April 1994 it is. And um, then that weekend, I got a call from Umesh Vazrani, and he said, I hear you can factor on a quantum computer. So there's, <coughs> well, so the, there's a couple of interesting things about this. The rumor mill got it from the interminable seminar on a Tuesday to Umesh on a Saturday or Sunday. So that was fast. And the other thing is that the rumor mill, I mean, you've probably heard of the game of telephone or whisper down the lane where some, one person whispers something to the next person, whispers to the next person. What explained in the internal seminar was how to do discrete logs. And when Umesh called me up, he says, I hear you can factor. 
<laughs> so there was this strange relation between factoring and discrete logs that I explained already. And so over the process of telephone, discrete log turned to factoring. Luckily, <laughs> I had managed to figure out how to factor between Tuesday and Saturday. <laughs> so I, I just explained the factoring algorithm to Umos. <laughs> and um, yeah. And not long after that, I started getting recalls from reporters. I think the first one was in, um, oh gosh, um, The Economist. And um, then in May, I gave a last minute talk at the Algorithmic Number Theory Symposium at Cornell. Um, and Umesh Fazrani explained the algorithm in the conference on quantum mechanics at the Santa Fe Institute in May. And you know, the conference had already been um, organized. I couldn't get away to go to it, but Umesh had, you know, knew about the factoring algorithm because it explained it to him, so he explained it. And then Arthur Eckert, as a physicist in um, England, and he gave a talk on this on an atomic physics conference in Boulder, Colorado in August. And again, he had heard about the um, factoring algorithm too. I should say that during this time, I was getting um, email from many people asking for a copy of my paper. I hadn't actually finished um, my paper. So I was sending out you know, copies which had errors in them. And um, you know, many months I got later, I got questions about the errors that I'd already fixed earlier because you know, the old papers were circulating. And so this was before you could just stick a paper on the internet and um, have everyone find it, so. And, you know, there was a conference, quantum computing conference at NIST in Gatorsburg <laughs> organized by the US government, and I gave a talk there. And another one in Turin, Italy in October. This was a continuing series of meetings about, I guess, quantum information theory. And, <clears throat> you know, I think only, uh, dozen or two people came to the first one, but um, after the factoring algorithm, the number of people coming to this conference um, started growing until it outgrew the conference center and was discontinued. And um, <coughs> conferences in November. Okay. So in November as well, Ignacio Sirac and Peter Zoller wrote a paper saying how to do quantum computers with cold trapped ions. And you know, this was, I think, the first really um, practical suggestion for doing quantum computers. And Chris Monroe at Duke has an ion trap computer. And here is, well, this is the quantum chip which actually has the ions trapped in it and um, okay you, I mean you can see actually I can't see on this because I'm but there's a, a blow up of the ions here um, really they're down here and probably really invisible in the um, picture but this is the chip that does the work and at the minute at the middle of this great maze of lasers and optical elements and stuff. You have this chip and these, op, you know, this um, apparatus is all um, <coughs> aimed at manipulating the states of the ions on this chip. <coughs> okay, so there's one reaction to the factoring algorithm. This is never going to work in practice. And one of the more eloquent people who had this reaction was Rolf Landauer, and here is his explanation. And I'm going to just give a summary of his objection. Basically, quantum computers are essentially analog, and analog computers can't 
correct errors. So quantum computers can't correct errors, and that means that you'll never actually be able to get accurate results out of them. <clears throat> so in retrospect, I can give a refutation of his objection, which is quantum objects are both waves and particles. And similarly, quantum computers are both analog and digital. <laughs> and we use the analog, um, I guess, aspect of quantum computers to do <coughs> computations you cannot do on digital computers, but we use the digital aspect of quantum computers to correct the errors. <clears throat> so this is, um, yeah, this, this is why this objection is not valid. So how bad is, was the situation? Well, to factor cryptographically important numbers, you know, with my algorithm at the, you know, at the time, you have to perform at least 10 to the 9 quantum gates. And if you're doing 10 to the 9th quantum gates on a noisy quantum computer, you need to implement each quantum gate with inaccuracy less than 10 to the minus 9 to get the right result at the end of the computation. And, you know, this is impossible. <clears throat> and of course, there are lots of computations that would require many more than 10 to the ninth quantum bits that you might, quantum gates that you might want to do. <clears throat> so, first correction, okay, question is, can you use error correction? So in the 1950s, von Neumann wrote a beautiful paper showing that you can perform noise-free computations using noisy gates with only a modest amount of extra overhead. Um, so you can ask, can you use classical fault-tolerant techniques to make quantum computers error-resistant? So at first glance, it appeared that this answer was no. So why not? Well, there's the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which we've already talked about. You cannot completely measure an unknown quantum state. So basically, any attempt to measure an unknown quantum state inexorably disturbs it, which is the reason that Wiesner's quantum money and Ben and Brassard's quantum key distribution works. And there's also the no cloning theorem, which says you cannot duplicate an unknown quantum state. And these two no-go principles are actually quite closely related. <coughs> so we can look at the classical fault tolerance technique and ask which ones might possibly be usable to make quantum computers error resistance. Well, what are the classical fault tolerance techniques? There's consistency checks, and that's, you know, if you know at some point during the computation that the two bits, two of your bits in the computation has to be equal, you can check whether they're equal. And Consistency checks don't really work very well, both on classical computers and on quantum computers. I mean, they help, <coughs> but they don't help all that much. You can do checkpointing, and there you write down the state of the computation periodically, and if the computation derails, you don't have to go back to the beginning again. You can go back to the previous checkpoint, but this violates the no cloning theorem because if you keep on doing the computation, you can't write down its state because that would be cloning. There's massive redundancy. You keep k copies of everything in your computation around. And if one of the copies of your computation um, gets corrupted, you still have k minus 1 copies. But if one fails, you need to recover k copies from k minus 1 copies of the computation. And this also violates the no cloning theorem. And finally, there's the last technique, which is error correcting codes, which you add some extra bits of redundancy, and these let you discover errors and correct them. But these look like they violate the no cloning theorem because the extra bits of redundancy look like they're clones of your original bits, but they actually don't violate the no cloning theorem and they actually work. So let's talk about them. So the simplest classical error correcting code is the repetition code. If you have a zero, you make three copies of it. And if you have a one, you make three copies of it. And now if one of these copies gets 
one of these three bits gets corrupted, you can correct it by just taking the majority vote. Okay, so what about the quantum version? Well, that would be uh, zero state, zero state of a qubit, two, zero, zero, zero of three qubits, and a one, two, one, one, one. So why isn't this cloning? Well, because if you have three qubits, you have a supervision of one over two, zero plus one, it goes to a superposition of zero, 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 plus one, one, one. And a quantum cloner, if you had a one over two, zero plus one, would have to go to three copies of the superposition of zero plus one. So it's not a quantum cloner. And in fact, this is a valid transformation according to the laws of quantum mechanics. So a qubit is a two-dimensional complex vector space, as I said before. Evolution in quantum mechanics is linear, and a linear operation on a vector space is just the matrix. <coughs> and there are three very important linear operations on qubits, and in fact, three very important linear operations. I mean, these are important in qubits, I mean, for physics and not just quantum computation, and that's why they named after Pauli, who was around long before quantum computation. And the three Pauli matrices are sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. And what is the quantum repetition code? Well, that was zero, zero, goes to zero, 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 one goes to one, one, one. And I want to claim this works against bit flips. So suppose someone applies a sigma x operation to one of your qubits. If they apply it to the second qubit, it takes zero, zero, zero to zero, one, zero, and one, one, one to one, zero, one. And now you can measure which of these bits is different. And the possible answers are none, bit one, bit two, and bit three. And once you get the result of this measurement, you know which bit to correct, and applying sigma x to the incorrect bit corrects the error. <coughs> and it turns out you can make this measurement with a simple quantum circuit. Um, so, and, um, Mathematically, it's basically projecting to onto one of these four subspaces. And there's a simple quantum circuit that does this. So the quantum repetition code works for supervisions of encoded zeros and ones. And if you have um, this state encoded and you have a bit flip on the second qubit, you measure bit two is flipped and now you apply sigma x to second bit, and you correct this to alpha 0, 0, 0 plus beta 1, 1, 1 again. So that's the quantum repetition code. It works great on bit flips. And in fact, Asher Perez realized this in a 1985 paper. But you know, to do quantum computation, you need to correct more than bit errors. You need to keep the computation coherent, which means you have to worry about phase errors. And worrying about phase errors, it turns out, I mean, the simplest phase error is a phase flip. And in fact, it turns out that correcting the simplest phase error is a good start on correcting all phase errors. And Asher Perez didn't worry about phase errors because all he was trying to do was implement reversible classical computation on a quantum computer. And to do that, you just need to protect against bit errors. So here's the three bit quantum repetition code and what happens when you have a phase flip error. Well, the zero qubit goes to zero, 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 which is encoded zero. Coded one goes to one, one, one. And if you make a phase flip error on any one of these three bits, you get a phase flip error on the encoded bit. So that makes phase flips three times as likely on the encoded qubits. Okay. So that code didn't really work well. <coughs> so what I realized is there's another three qubit code, a unitary transformation which is called a Hadamard gate, takes bit flips to phase flips and vice versa. So suppose we applied a Hadamard gate to the three encoding qubits in our little quantum code. What does this do? Well, it takes zero to a superposition of all states with an even number of 
ones and a one to a superposition of an all states with an odd number of ones. And now suppose you apply a bit flip on any qubit. <coughs> well, an it, a bit flip on any qubit turns an even number of ones into an odd number of ones and vice versa. So bit flips are three times as likely in your encoded qubit. But it turns out any single phase flip error is correctable. So now we have one three qubit code which protects against bit errors but makes phase errors more likely. We have one three bit qubit code which protects against phase errors and makes bit errors more likely. So it seems like we've stuck. We can squeeze the phase errors so that we can correct them, but then that makes the bit errors worse and vice versa. So what do we do? Well, what we do is we concatenate the codes to get a nine qubit code. And <clears throat> concatenating codes is a standard technique in um, the classical theory of error correcting codes. And I had worked at Bell Labs and had seen all sorts of talks on classical error correcting codes. And so I knew about this technique. And what we do is we first encode the qubit using one three qubit code. Then we encode each of the resulting qubits using the other three qubit code. And now the code will protect against both phase errors and bit errors. So how does this work? Well, step one is encode using the outer code, which is the one that protects against phase flip errors. So here we are. And now encode each of the qubits using the inner code, which protects against bit errors. And this code will correct any error in any one of the nine qubits. <clears throat> the outer code corrects the phase errors, and the inner one corrects the bit errors. So here we are. There are three poly matrices, and the you know, sigma x, which is a bit, error, bit flip error, sigma z, which is a phase flip error, and sigma y, which is essentially both a bit flip and a phase flip error because it's i, which is actually a, an immaterial phase, times a bit flip error times a phase flip error. OK. So since it can correct one bit <coughs> phase error and a different bit error, it can correct a sigma y error. So here's our nine qubit code. And while we can answer the question, how did we get around the uncertainty principle? If you measure the error, you disturb the state of the system. But what we did is we constructed codes where we can measure the error assuming it falls into some set of likely errors without measuring the encoded quantum state. And we can then correct the error without disturbing the quantum state. And this requires us to find codes with the likely errors. In this case, it's any one bit error are orthogonal to the encoded state. So that's not, it's not obvious how to find them, but um, I will explain how we did that soon. But you know, there are lots of other operations you can do to qubits which are not sigma x, sigma z, and sigma y. So what do we do? Well, there's this beautiful theorem that if you can correct an error in any single qubit using one of the three Pelly matrices, then you can fix any error as long as it's restricted to one qubit. So how does this work? <coughs> well. The proof sketch, I won't go into the details, is an arbitrary one qubit error E can be written as a two by two matrix. And any two by two matrix can be expressed as some constant times the identity plus const some constant times sigma x plus some constant times sigma y plus some constant times sigma z. And now what we do is we measure the state to identify the error. And when we measure the state, what happens is we collapse the state to either have no error are to have one of these three Pelly errors. And now that we know the state error because the state has collapsed, we can correct it. <clears throat> so this is how quantum mechanics transforms analog errors into digital errors. It's because, well, it's the same, essentially the same reason that particles are both waves and um, particles. <clears throat> When we measure a particle, 
It behaves like a particle. When we don't measure it, it behaves like a wave. Okay. So I want to say now, is this a paradox? So Rolf Landauer had this great um, motto, information is physical. So what you can do is you can take a qubit, you can distribute it among five different qubits using um, a quantum circuit, and now you can um, apply any one qubit operation to any of these five qubits, and then you can correct it. So our question is, where is the qubit when it's encoded in a quantum error correcting code? Well, it's not encoded in any one of these five qubits, and there is no redundancy, so there's only one qubit among these five. There's only one copy of this qubit stored in these five qubits, and it's not contained in any of these encoding qubits, because any, removing any qubit doesn't change our encoded qubit. So information is somehow you know, distributed among these without being located in any single one of them. Okay, how much more time do I have? Looks like 10 minutes. What? Five minutes? Okay, so the repetition Peter, code. I have a quick question. Okay. Here, go on. Um, so, is that why, um, I forget about that, forgetting about, um, you know, the brain is quantum, uh, whose theory is that? Um, Penrose, if you go back to the previous slide, yeah. is that why Penrose thinks that the brain is quantum? I really don't know why Penrose You know, thinks it's a very <laughs> similar I, Yeah, I know what Penrose, th I know, you know, I've read Penrose's book, I know he thinks the brain is quantum, but I don't agree with it, and I don't agree with any of the reasons he gives in this book, so. <laughs> yes, yes, I was just wondering, as you were explaining, see, memory is like that. Nobody knows where the memory really is in the brain. That's it's right. distributed. And yeah. that should be classical emergence, distributed emergent mm -hmm. phenomenon, right? Yeah. But uh, that's a very good um, analogy. Yeah, it is. <laughs> okay. So let's see. So while well, the repetition code has been known for centuries, better classical codes weren't discovered until 1950. And one of the first ones to be discovered was Hamming code. And the seven bit Hamming code has these code words that map four bits into seven bits and it can correct one error. And well, I tried to find better quantum codes than the repetition code. And you know, one of the ways I tried to do this is try to adapt the classical Hamming code into a quantum code. And in fact, after some trial and error, I figured out you could encode one qubit into seven qubits with this transformation. And this corrects any one bit error because we started with a classical Hamming code. And if we apply a Hadamard transform to each of the qubits in the code, it yields the same code. And that means it will correct one phase error because this Hadamard transform changes bit errors into phase errors and vice versa. So here we have a seven qubit code that corrects one bit error and one phase error. And this quantum Hamming code was discovered independently by Rob Calderbank and me, and it's the smallest code in the class of CSS codes, which were also independently discovered by Rob Calderbank and me and Andrew Steen. And a CSS code comes from two classical error correcting codes, C1 and C2 dual, with C2 contained in C1. And taking the Hadamard transform switches the roles of C2 and C1. And the C1 is used to correct bit errors, C2 dual is used to correct phase errors. Okay. And the other thing is classical coding theorists have already compiled exhaustive li lists of classical error correcting codes with, you know, weakly self dual properties and everything. So we can find lots of classical quantum codes by looking at these catalogs of classical error correcting codes that the classical coding thirds had found. Okay, let's skip that. And, um, 
and let's go back to BB84. So in the late 1990s, two groups found proofs of security of the BB84 quantum key distribution algorithm. They were both very complicated. So I went through one of these proofs and realized that at the heart of it, there really were CSS codes. And this led me and John Preskill to come up with a much simpler proof of the security of BB84 by using CSS codes. So I think it was four pages long rather than 30 pages or something, and it was very easy to explain. And the trickiest thing about proving the security of BB84 was doing it when the apparatus is faulty, and you need an error-correcting code to correct, reconcile Alice's and Bob's secret keys, and you needed a hash function to amplify their privacy. And the error-correcting code turns out to be one of the two codes that go into a CSS code, and the hash function is derived from the other code that goes into a CSS code, and then you can prove that BB84 is secure by just using the fact that a CSS code is secure. And I want to say a couple more words. The world of quantum mechanics is not the world of your intuition. Quantum mechanics really changes theories. So the theory of computation is changed. Information theory is changed. Cryptography is changed. So quantum mechanics is really very strange, as I said in the first thing. And I have written a poem, so I'm an amateur poet, about the strangeness of quantum mechanics, and I want to read it to you. I am the spooky action at a distance, the seething chaos that fills up empty space, the wave function collapse that you shall never witness, the living grin upon the dead cat's face. Am I a wave? Am I a particle? Am I analog or digital? The answers surely must be both or none. My laws say quarks and clocks alike show interference, that if you watch a state, it never changes, that two entangled systems act as one. I make superconductors lose all their resistance. I make the atom split, the laser gleam. And although you may be bewildered by my strangeness, I am real. You are living in a dream.